Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld and welcome to the Cloud 2030 discussion. Uh, this is the first of a weekly series of discussions relating to how we think cloud is going to evolve in the next 10 years. Please be part of the conversation. Uh, this is a long topic, so we will probably snippet things in and out and uh, have additional discussions on our uh, Cloud 2030 site. So please come in, sign up for next sessions, and uh, we'll see you there. You know, I booked out two hours to get maximum exposure here. I figure we're going to do some circular agenda on on this and uh, yeah. let let things roll a bit from a discussion perspective. I, do people have topics they definitely want to cover? Things that that we we think for the this meeting, like we want to go back through. Security, of course, from my end. How, how, I mean, how well do people have notes remember the 2020, the 2020 event? <laughs> I, I don't remember anything because I was busy uh, running around taking care of stuff. So it all, I, I, it all came true. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you all were prescient. Rob, we I'm made it to 2020. <laughs> but let me show you. <laughs> you have scars, oh, there you go. scar tissues. <laughs> I got I got shivved on stage. It was ugly. Ooh. <laughs> I, I think know, uh, I, the right crowd, now the maybe. only evidence we have is Gina's uh, blog post, like nothing else, I guess. Yeah. yeah. That's and a little scary. <laughs> and and your, your predictions, Gina, too. I think honestly were the most most uh, tangible and and provable ones. Right. It's so weird because I have this theme, you know, throughout my career, you know, because of my background and how I, you know, where I came from and everything, this very um, um, intense desire to make sure that the normal people, especially people that are disenfranchised, don't get left behind. Um, so, uh, of course, I write about that all the time. <laughs> I probably remember that more than I remember what really was the biggest theme of it. So, sorry, everybody. <laughs> uh, that's perfectly fine. Like, perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what I presented, but I remember what you presented. So that's interesting. <laughs> if it wasn't for, I think, Josh's slide or picture the other day on Twitter, now I remember what I presented. It was really boring storage media stuff, even though it was kind of important <laughs> seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, Pretty that, commoditized today. That, hey, Val, that was still before you were paroled from NetApp, right? <laughs> well, I, I went into NetApp Exile twice, and I won't bore you with the first time, which was pre Y two K. But the second one, I got acquired back with uh, with SolidFire. So yeah, classic. Yeah, where were people in twenty two thousand three? No, it was twenty thirteen. I keep doing this. Yeah, in twenty thirteen, so seven years ago. I mean, this was pre OpenStack. Mm. No, uh, OpenStack was. was, was uh, OpenStack was there, like, uh, that was yeah, our punching bag at the time. Oh, yeah, you're right, 2011. This, right. this yeah. is literally the weekend that the Instratus acquisition was announced. Yes, exactly. I exactly. remember that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, that was the big one, because I joined, I joined Piston as head of product September of 2013. Wow. Yeah, I remember uh, landing in uh, Las Vegas and George coming and telling me, hey, we got acquired, but keep quiet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually want to put multi-cloud automation on the on this on this list. Uh, it's still a windmill, right? <laughs> I, I, I just I recently had a uh, long conversation as they always are with Joe Weinman. Um, uh, I was offering my uh, my critique of his book Foglonomics, and of course, Joe is always on the theoretical bandwagon of the hybrid multi-cloud, and. and I, I think that would be an awesome topic to to throw out there. Yeah, in fact, if you want to get really specific, one of the three most popular talks at Black Hat, the virtual Black Hat last week, or I guess DEF CON technically, was um, the massive security holes and identity across multi-cloud. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, OK. Mm -hmm. Did these things come up in 2020? I mean, how much of this was? Uh, the Reason uh, we, uh, I, I, like uh, we were uh, uh, doing the 2020. One of the reasons uh, is 
at that time, like uh, I was pushing for federated clouds, and uh, th that was the reason we wanted to run that event and see uh, what is the kind of feedback we can get. We had a panel. I think uh, uh, John was there in that panel, and uh, I, I don't know who uh, who was moderating it. I think Josh or somebody was moderating it. So we had a panel. It was not multi-cloud, but uh, the producers are to multi-cloud at the time. Yeah. Uh, it Jared, Jared was there too. I'm trying to remember if Jared talked or if Jared ended up moderating the panel. Yeah, Jared was there. Uh, he was, I think he was in another panel at the time. Yeah. So Rob would love to toss out um, uh, serverless versus DevOps. <laughs> serverless <laughs> DevOps. <laughs> I like the versus part there. No ops. No ops, no code, no anything. No ops, okay. no code. Yeah. <laughs> DevOps. So, ops. Uh, I think uh, uh, Rob, uh, what the topic I suggested was like uh, how you can tap uh, tap into machine learning and AI to manage distributed infrastructure. So multi-cloud is of course part of it and uh, edge and IoT, everything. Mm coming together and uh, how can we sort of like uh, bring it all together in a way which is manageable. So that is the topic I, I sort of like uh, want to talk about it. I think, or think about it. That's a, there's a lot of debate about what the practicality is of the internet of things and what all that thing. There's a lot of like theoretical mumbo jumbo about autonomous things and what have you, but there's very few I think very real tangible things going on and it's still there's like the field of possibilities is still pretty broad yeah makes it fun to debate well and, I, and krish when i was on your podcast recently we talked about serverless on the edge mm -hmm. and some of those kind of pushing the envelope kind of things i'd be really yeah. interested to see what other people think about that topic yeah Actually, of, John where, where's, interested in that. yeah where's mark teeley I oh. don't know. He might be coming in. I'll, I'll ping him and see if he can join. He's a well, he just had a launch this today. week, right? Yeah, pretty yeah. cool launch, actually. Yeah. So uh, the edge thing, I think, is interesting to talk about too. Just from an, uh, what is the edge and how it's much different than it's at, than it's being um, sold or talked about by the big vendors. Sure. I think that was a big thing from the first one. Just what is multi-cloud and what is the cloud and there's a lot of those definitions right that that we debated back then about what cloud mm -hmm. was and what multi-cloud was it seems like we're having those same conversations again about edge definitions i agree with that gene <laughs> multi-cloud for me has turned out to be not uh you know not the the spreading infrastructure across clouds for redundancy so much as uh taking advantage of specialized clouds so like the system yeah. I run today, uh, you know, we're using Brightcove for streaming, uh, you know, we're borrowing identity from different services rather than implementing our own. Uh, but the bulk of the, the commodity stuff is, you know, is, you know, your typical Lambda, AWS Gateway, DynamoDB, you know, sort of serverless thing but it's not trying to get the commodity stuff spread across Amazon and Google and, and Microsoft, which it's, is what we're really talking about in 2013. So yeah. now, um, so now we're seeing, I'm seeing more renewed interest in, in designing things from the network because all of this other stuff is happening and cloud adjacency is now becoming a really big area of focus for people to do this multi-cloud play. But what I thought was interesting with what Gina had said was, what does edge mean today, right? And Pete, you were talking about that too. And it means something different depending on the industry vertical. Mm -hmm. what, it, what, is edge, what is edge and edge compute for um, oil and gas is so different from what it is for retail. I had a yeah. so, experience so go ahead. With, that with, the, with the US military who, who I, like, you know, in a lot, like a lot of things, they're kind of like, four or five years ahead of, of, um, of like the commercial mainstream. And I think, I think they have, I think they've got, they've got, although they don't do things very effectively in the field today, they've got a very good handle on what the definition of edge is. I think that would be a great topic just generally, like what, what does it mean? Or even there, I think whatever the 
fix one. Yeah, and I think there's a theme we can apply. So at least for me personally, seven years ago, multi-cloud was still a pretty academic concept. So I think I had very naive ideas of what the advantages were. Then, you know, you get into operationalizing some of these things and you realize the hard truths and engineering trade-offs, the, the, the economic theory doesn't match the reality, the operational reality of multi-cloud and yeah. the complexity yeah. there. And, and certainly the even economics, the, the real versus, you know, theoretical economics. And now, you know, I'm totally down the security thread. So the security risks of going multi-cloud in a very commoditized way completely negate any economic or other kind of operational advantages. Yeah. In fact, uh, in 20, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, go, thanks, go. Chris. I think um, that's where I was going, kind of what you just said about this back seven years ago was an, uh, kind of an academic discussion. I think edge um, is beyond an academic discussion now, but I think the majority of people don't see that. And so if I'm somebody trying to make a choice for what I'm trying to do, um, I may not understand what edge is because it, it is different definitions depending on what, how you're looking at it. So it's not academic, but it kind of is. Yeah. So what so maturity for me, okay, for me, we're in 20, uh, 2013, like I was uh, gungo about federated cloud and I thought uh, every hosting provider and every data center out there will come into some sort of a marketplace and uh, yeah, uh, transform themselves into a cloud provider. But uh, at that time, Alistair Kroll sort of like uh, said that the evolution is more to, uh, going to be like uh, airline industry. There will be few big players. There might be smaller airlines uh, taking care of regional interests, but it's going to be few, a handful of uh, big airlines. I think uh, we have reached that point at the, uh, right now. That's why right now when I look at multi-cloud, I don't just look at uh, multiple cloud providers trying to so, uh, give some sort of a high availability for existing application. As George pointed out, the uh, multi-cloud for me is using the right cloud service for the application needs. So it's not like uh, I'm failing over to another cloud provider over the internet. But that's uh, I'm not seeing that kind of uh, uh, workloads, but it's like uh, if I want to use Google for my AI related stuff, I will go with Google. If I'm going to use Amazon for DynamoDB, I'm going with the, uh, Amazon, of course, that has the problem of like data being in silos, but uh, that's a different problem we have to deal in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why like when I look at uh, infrastructure today, I look at um, the entire landscape from cloud to cloud services uh, that could span any multiple layers from infrastructure all the way to uh, serverless or whatever it is. And then uh, I look at the edge, IoT, all of them coming together to sort of form that necessary ecosystem for uh, of services that's needed for uh, organizations. That's all I see here. That's what I think uh, maybe uh, such a distributed, uh, to manage such a distributed environment, maybe you may have to rely on machine learning and uh, uh, deep learning to sort of like uh, get, gain the necessary insights and uh, then uh, drive the automation. Is that, is that RPA, robotic process automation? I was just thinking about that today, like, or, or I mean, because usually I think of that stuff as sort of BS. Sorry if you're a vendor there, but. Um, now, yeah. once you understand its niche, it's really strong in my mind that it's niche, right? It's essentially taking a lot of processes that used to be paper-based, but still have a lot of redundant manual read data entry. And it's really skilled at, you know, very roughly gluing together those processes and automating them so that you don't have to re-enter data manually anymore across accounts payable or receivable, you know, and things like that, you know, from suppliers all the way to the people you charge money for. I totally agree with you. I, I keep seeing RPA washing in the autom in the infrastructure automation space. And so I think there's... that's a little dangerous in my mind, but <laughs> maybe it works. Um... I'd love to hear Tyler. I Tyler and I were just chatting the other day, particularly when it comes to all sorts of data dispersal at the edge. You know his his view of the world and some of his um, his his products and, and architectures are really relevant here. Well, it's really uh, I guess my view of it is that the the next ten years it's it's going to be all about interoperability of a lot of different systems. We've moved from you know ten years ago we were talking about service oriented architectures to the to the API economy. And now we've got 
most organizations have this huge mix of, and Rob, you and I talked about that on the podcast about the data yeah. silos, right? That, right? that that hasn't changed. So it's, it seems to me that multi-cloud is, it's, it's, it's hugely problematic as a term because of all of the vendor um, misinterpretation of it. And, and we don't have a clear definition of what that means. But for me, Multi-cloud is really the process of governance and management of data and applications in a uh, heterogeneous world. That you've got everything from COBOL apps on mainframes to SaaS apps with your CRM to um, you know modern mobile apps running on Lambda functions on AWS, et cetera, so forth and so on. And nobody realistically is going to be a, be willing or able to go back and remediate all the technical debt and all the pre-existing systems. So the real mandate moving forward is going to be figuring out how to pull all of that data, that strategic asset from all of those systems, and then be able to turn those into uh, business outcomes or, or, or better decisions, analytics, uh, operational outcomes. So like for me, RPA is just the other side of the coin. You know, if you're going to do data pipeline automation for analytics using similar methodologies, it's RPA if you're looking at it in terms of operational processes. So that's, that's kind of my thought about it. I'm trying to capture, I'm trying to capture some notes from that because there's a ton of topics that I think each one would be worth exploring. I would definitely second the interoperability, but not just, mm -hmm. as you say, at one layer, but multiple layers. So for example, we're one of the founding members of the Interwork Alliance, and that's looking at it at the kind of multi-party smart contracts uh, sort of mm -hmm. layer, which is you know some way up the stack, but even that's not the top of the stack either. So, um, so I think interoperability uh, is going to be a well. It's it is already a, a huge topic, and and it's certainly going to be one of the main themes. I think um, if you're not familiar with the Interwork Alliance, it's it's it grew out of the token taxonomy framework, and is now looking at tokenization, smart contracts, and the bit that we're mostly involved in is the sort of analytics piece of that. So think of that as tokens, smart contracts, and then streams that uh, give you insights into, into what's going on. The, that brings up to me an interesting question that we haven't touched on at all yet, which is this API, you know, API contract, like you're, you're talking specific contracts and, and, and talk, you know, and having well, the, the kind of, between. Yeah. The con sorry, contracts is such a, uh, yet another overloaded term so yeah. here. We're talking about, um, really business processes. So th think of it as, um, uh, if you're familiar with things like solidity, it's, it's, a, it's, it's trying to extract or step away from things like solidity or even dam or various other smart contract sort of flavors and say, well, what do they share in common? Um, how do you manage things like privacy whilst you're also, uh, handling, you know, relationships which span multiple parties, which again, I think is a theme that would be relevant to, to this, this, it, this audience as well. Would in, in, in the 2013 group, did y'all talk about like API definition and specs and, and um, trade groups? Like at the time there was, a, there were trade groups trying to form like a cloud API standards and interoperability work and, and things like that. And I'm, it feels like a lot of that stuff is not progressing. I mean, Duncan, you're making me think that maybe it is alive and well somewhere, but but much further up the stack, to be fair. Yeah. Or, well, or yeah. just like we've messed things up in infrastructure and we're not able to have a trade group anymore. What? Uh, uh, but I, I can things, like, things like infrastructure of co as code have kind of taken over that, right? Where you can define things in Terraform or Ansible or whatever, and you don't have to know the specific APIs that are being called anymore to, necessi to necessitate a standard necessarily. Uh, I Terraform, well, the Terraform the, plan is not much of a standard. They're, each one is vendor. Well, I'm not saying it's a standard. I'm saying it's a way around the problem of having to learn mm -hmm. the multiple cloud APIs. 
<laughs> not not better, just different than I th how I think we thought. Having about just, it we just ago. looked at plans and they break in because of the, the underlying implementations. I'm just that's actually true. I mean, that's why people are, be, are using it because then they don't have they're paying someone else to go and learn all those different APIs. Um, but uh, I just want to also make sure with all of this that we do also have that refocus on the network because I'm actually seeing mm. that that's one of the biggest barriers to any kind of serious scalable adoption right now is because there has been no innovation in network for so long. Now everybody's looking at doing more spine and leaf versus traditional three tier data center network design. And so you're starting to see people riding the Equinix mesh, for example, so that they can cut down on their egress charges with their own DCs. And as the, I think that's a big thing we should all mm. also keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And then we're micro segmenting on top of that for zero trust. So, yeah. Exactly. Ooh, interesting. Guys, yeah, guys, just before we get off that topic that Duncan was was uh, expounding upon, I think it would be relevant to have like a Web 3.0 decentralized web track in all mm -hmm. of this. Just broadly. Cool. Yep. Great suggestion, John. Web 3.0. Web is, this, is this like is this like is this a is this like a, a, a you know smoke screen for talking about blockchain or is it or is there do we, <laughs> uh, distributed ledgers a part of it but see I think I think that blockchain is a part of it there are some blockchain purists that uh, I think would be fascinating uh, I would refer to them as chum in the water but bring them anyway um, mm -hmm. you know, right. it's all part of, it's all part of that discussion right it's all part of that track. Um, what what else what else is in that? Quick. Sorry, I, I missed something there. I missed that. Uh, I, I said quick. Uh, QIC the HTTP over UDP, which um, at, at least on the it, it doesn't affect so much the infrastructure part of things things, but when you go towards like uh, established HTTP software and uh, and tools like proxies. They, they don't speak quick. Um, a lot of the assumptions that are made by proxies these days don't work with UDP. Hmm. Well, we can have a whole TLS 1.3 thread as well. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, here's, I think, a common use case that keeps me up at night that we should measure a lot of these topics by. So we're about three years old now, just about three years old as a startup. And I've literally lost track of the number of SaaS suppliers we depend on. And mm -hmm. data <laughs> governance, right? And Sorry, we shouldn't laugh. Yeah, it, that's a real problem, right? You know, Tyler's point is, how do I even know where my data is? How can I apply a governance policy? How can I be compliant and measure my compliance? How can I actually try and put up a security strategy? It's a, uh, these are real world, again, operational oh, challenges. Here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, the corollary to that is if we're building these systems that the data can go anywhere and be used for any type of compute, then how are we building protections and for society mm -hmm. as a whole? That yes. that doesn't get abused. Well, well yeah, and that, that gets to the whole data privacy issues, so data control. So mm -hmm. we, we see that from a, uh, a, a compliance standpoint and a policy standpoint, but we also see it from a vendor standpoint and, and companies that are using, they, they recognize the strategic nature of, the cust of their customers' data and they're using that um, uh, for market power. Yeah. I mean, all you gotta do is play around with data models and Salesforce for a little while. We, yeah, we five years ago, I would tell people that's creepy. <laughs> now it's like, it's really creepy. Software as a service sprawl, Val, can we call it that? <laughs> SaaS sprawl. Yeah, I, I, I have death by silos, but I'll, I'll, I like SaaS, SaaS sprawl too. <laughs> yeah, SaaS sprawl for sure. That sounds like a drink almost. Sarsaparilla. Sarsaparilla. <laughs> I like. I, I also like the death by silos. I think uh, if we had, if we could do a, a, a business strategy or a partnership with technology, whatever that kind of a track, 
the silos are just getting even worse. If we have, we have, for example, we have retail companies who are growing their spend on AWS by 20, 25% every year because they're only focusing on the things they need to do, uh, and rightly so. But then because of COVID, their revenues are down by 39%. So you're growing faster than your revenues are growing at the moment. It's in the cloud versus, you know, actual dollars. Makes sense. No, that's, did y'all, did y'all talk about, <laughs> did y'all talk about the SaaS, like the amount to which we have SaaS deployment in, 2000, in 2013? I mean, at the time we were sort of saying the only way software companies are going to be software companies is on, as a SaaS. I think that was a theme. Uh, I think, I think it was, I don't think it was, was really a big topic because it was, you know, everyone was still really enamored with the whole platform economy model and everybody was still gravitating to it. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that crowded a space just yet. Yeah, I don't know when it happened, but I took a look at a NetApp audit, an IT audit, and it was something like 1,500 SaaS providers at some point in time that NetApp IT tried to manage mm. or knew of, I guess I should say. Uh, the last time I did, yeah, last time I did research on how many SaaS providers were out was probably four years ago, and there were already eighteen hundred of them then. I can't even imagine probably four thousand or more available on the market today. Uh, it, just the just in the CMCF. Almost certainly bigger. It, yeah. It's it's it, so in twenty thirteen I uh, ran product for the VMware practice at Rackspace, and we had three thousand customers, and I did a study of our installed base. And our number one market segment was SaaS providers running on our VMware dedicated environments. And I think the number then was like 1,200. And we were only one service provider. Yeah. Mm. So I think another topic, um, and it's great, um, Mark, that you, uh, you're actually you're joining us, especially on, on the back of Edgevana, because sustainability is a is a is a you know one of the key themes that you you've brought out in 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 your release and i think you know that's absolutely something that needs to be thought through what what yeah. does it mean you know because sustainability means so many different things but you know you can tie it to the un sustainable development goals right. uh, and 20 other things but i think that's you know that's now a huge priority for all of us i agree and i i don't um no, I don't, uh, I'm certainly not a, um, I'm not a technology everywhere all the time person. A lot of people assume when they come into my house, the house will talk to them and tell them what's going on because of my nature. But in, the reality is, is my house is relatively dumb um, still. And I'll probably keep it that way for the time being. Um, that being said, I don't, I don't necessarily want to um, stop the growth of IT or infrastructure. That's never been my goal. In fact, I've, I've fought since probably 2004, 2005, mm -hmm. to find alternatives to where we source energy, not because I was worried as much about sustainability as I didn't want something to get in the way unnecessarily of um, lowering the barriers to entry for the development of better technology, right? So for me, a, a major theme underlying what I'm trying to do with Edgevana, and I'm, I, I'm not really not here to talk about Edgevana guys, but I appreciate Duncan um, mentioning it all the same, um, is that there's an immense amount of infrastructure waiting to be used. And I mean, uh, uh, Rob and I have had this conversation probably a dozen times, but there's an immense amount of infrastructure that's waiting, whether that infrastructure is is in the form of air conditioning units and transfers, transformers and and generators and buildings uh, that belong to data centers all around the world that are largely mm -hmm. invisible as a, as a result of companies like Equinix and AWS owning the markets, or it's infrastructure that belongs to companies that they're not getting enough usage out of, but they have to maintain for some time to come, <clears throat> or any combination of the above. The opportunity to find a way to leverage that and while leveraging it, actually lowering the barrier to entry for a market to develop, it just seems like it's kind of a, a you know, a, a little extra frosting on your Cinnabon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds, do, do we need, you know, should one of our topics then become, you know, physical data centers and, and new next generation data center designs? Yes. 
And so that allows us to bring in the whole cloud adjacency conversation and what distributed data center design models actually look like for customers. And then also for the top providers, um, how Colo is now becoming hip again, because Colo is now known as cloud adjacency. Plus, um, if, you, if you look at what, um, you know, uh, some of us have been harping about uh, repatriation and, and the fact that everything's not going to go to cloud as fast as everybody thought it would, et cetera. Um, uh, 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 you know, we've been talking about it for a while, but um, even today, Laurie uh, McVitie, I'm sure most of you know, uh, posted a pretty good blog about um, uh, repatriation and, you know, cloud phase three versus phase four, et cetera, that I thought was pretty apropos. Um, in fact, I would suggest we invite her if she hasn't already been invited, because uh, she's just an amazing um, talent. Um, yes. And uh, um, and just super. I mean, she's scary smart. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know why she puts up with talking to me, but um, but that probably goes for almost everybody here on this call. Um, but she's uh, you know she's made I think some good points, and admittedly, uh, she works for a company that has been hardware focused for a long time, but. Um, the, the truth is as well that uh, um, even F5 is now going mostly virtual. So um, they're trying, yeah, they're trying so, really hard to, to, to change their licensing model so that they can allow people to do that virtual. That's software. right. That's right. And so I, I, think, um, I think the discussion of data center is important because, um, you know, we're looking at, we're looking at cloud growth that is, is likely to stay at around 20, 25% for some time to come but it's cloud growth that is against a market that continues to grow from a total um, addressable market size that continues to grow. Um, and it doesn't even take into account the potential market size growth of edge computing and how that impacts. And so when you, when you think about how much data center space we have on the market today, and if you talk to Christian Bellotti or Joe Cava, Christian Bellotti from Microsoft or Joe Cava from Google uh, or James uh, from um, Amazon, all of them will tell you the same thing. They can't hardly build fast enough at their current growth rates. Um, and so that being said, uh, if edge is expected to add um, or to be bigger than public cloud, which I even have, am estimating now uh, in the next eight years, um, if we maximize the use of everything we have that's already been built, we still won't have nearly enough and people are gonna to need to build and we're gonna to need to be able to build smart. We're gonna to need to be able to find ways to get access to markets more efficiently. Uh, and again, I mean, that's uh, part and parcel with what I'm trying to build. Um, and it goes back to the whole model of sustainability. Anything mm -hmm. we can do to keep them from bulldozing more property and laying more cement and putting more tarmac on the ground and, and et cetera, et cetera, as far as I'm concerned is a good thing. Um, and one of the things that I've been sitting here thinking, and I don't know the demographics of everyone who's on the call, but um, we hear so much about AWS, Microsoft, and Google, and uh, Mark was just talking about the big ones. Um, is there a topic of sort of the role that companies, we want those companies to play or leadership roles that those companies can play versus independent companies like RackN. I mean, is, is that a relevant discussion in, in all of this? Are we sort of biased in any of our thinking because of who we are? Just some things that I've been sitting here thinking. I think it I think it depends from which perspective you want to look at that. If we were to look at it from what are they doing for their customers and how are they actually delivering value for their customers, um, that is actually something we should probably have a talk track on. Like what could the public cloud providers be doing better in understanding where their customers are going? Um, for example, I don't think that AWS or Microsoft realize that their express routes and their direct connects would actually cause people to think more about going to, you know, digital realty and megaport and, you know, Equinix for their cloud exchange. So I, I, I think um, they were at the forefront of a network re-architecture, but they didn't know it. You know, I would also say though, that it's, um, it's a dangerous game to play with those guys. I, I did a little bit of that playing when I was at Ericsson um, and whether it's Ali Cloud um, from Alibaba or Amazon or Microsoft, I can tell you that the only reason they entertained conversations with Ericsson was because they wanted to get access to Ericsson's customer. Mm. 
They had no interest at all in deploying anything that Ericsson was building other than to deploy enough of it to keep us in the conversation. The other thing I would also say to add to your point there, Mark, is I think the I think the public cloud providers should also be thinking about data strategies and helping their customers with data strategies. So the whole thing with you know Dave McCrory's theory of data gravity is that applications are going to grow, right? The applications grow so the data sets end up growing. Great. But what you have is now the the cloud providers are actually seeing that as a sticky point so that they can keep people in their walled gardens. They should be actually saying, you know what? We have a partnership with Equinix. We have a partnership with DRT. We have a partnership with NDT, whoever. Let, you should be thinking about this data sovereignty thing. You should be thinking about how you how you have that kind of access. But they're, but, but they're not doing that, right? So, it, which is good because then it's down to people like us, you know, and, you know, Tim Crawford, who's not here today, would be able to say like, hey, you know, you had you should have a data strategy. You should think about how and where you place your IP, and then how it's then accessible by all your applications, the edge, and all of those other pieces. So why would you want to put it this whole eggs in one basket thing too, right? If you leave it all in AWS, then now everything has to interconnect back into your availability zone or whatever to actually access your data. But if you had it cloud adjacent, in say Equinix's cloud exchange, anything can actually get to it. Your SaaS provider can get to it. Your partner ecosystem can get to it. Your customers can get to it. I think, unfortunately, we, we probably won't see the, the large cloud providers move at least successfully in that direction um, because, you know, having been a product manager in the past, I know that, you know, when you're looking at, the, at, at your P&L for your product line, you're focused on maximizing revenue per customer and minimizing customer churn. And both of those work against uh, the, the type of, you know, so optimizing for the minimization of data of gravity and making things uh, easier to move around. So I think we'll see, pro perhaps, I, I'm not sure, but there's an opportunity for cloud service providers to fill that gap to, to be a third party, to bring, bring those types of solutions that create, uh, uh, you know, better optimization from a data standpoint. Um, to this point, I've not been impressed by any of the cloud service providers and being able to be successful with that. But this is in my mind what Mark is trying to do, obviously, in one sense, including Edge now. And John and I, seven years ago, were trying to do this just, you know, with brokering infrastructure as a service at way too fine grain a level, I think. So in my mind, Caroline, this will come back to government regulation. There's no incentive whatsoever for, for the hyperscalers to sell against themselves basically by not locking a customer in. But sooner or later, you know, some layer of the stack, I don't know which layer or all of them, we will need some level of government regulation just for the visibility and the oversight and some of the, uh, you know, the gaming of algorithms that Gina is worried about, you know, beyond privacy to the actual abuse of individuals, targeted abuse of individuals or organizations. That's where we'll need some kind of government regulation and, you know, various layers of the stack to, to prevent, you know, some of the things that, some of the problems you raised. And brokers are in a, they are in the business position to do that. <laughs> Do you think that they're going to be cloud? I mean, cloud brokers was a big topic in 2013. Are we, mm -hmm. are we due to have a reset on that topic? I see a bunch of people nodding. I, uh, I, yeah. I saw it as not working. Right. I didn't see you, you were right back cloud. then, <laughs> but I think yeah. we've learned a lot since. <laughs> so, you know, I would, I think that, uh, you know, so George, is George still on the call? Where'd he go? Oh, you, go? you shifted, you shifted, George. You're <laughs> <in the laughs> moving around. It's kind of yeah, weird. Ordered, uh, Hollywood squares over to the other side. Um, you know, what, you know, what, what you and James Thomason were building at Dell when they acquired in Stratia, I think, I think that model all worked. I think if Dell doesn't like pivot and buy EMC and then shutter Dell, uh, Dell software, I think that actually becomes a viable model because the whole brokerage concept of a large company like Dell stepping into the, into the middle of liability so that um, large customers can procure from a single source. I think that that dog hunts, but I think Dell just, you know, again, for, you know, 
you know, Dell being <laughs> Dell, um, got into a corporate development. Got, Michael got distracted, you know, with the shiny object of EMC and, you know, it, it just, it pivoted. But I think, I think you guys are on the right track. We were having problems getting oxygen well before the EMC thing came through. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think what George started and what uh, um, the guys at Service Mesh started, uh, admittedly, I was there for a little while. I mean, bottom line is it was five years, maybe even seven years too early. Um, yeah. even, in, even in 2012, 2013, at the end of days for Instratius and Service Mesh, as far as publicly recognizable brands, um, they were still only one and a half years into the point where 50% of the population could spell cloud, let alone <laughs> yep. figure out how to use three or four of them at the same time. And, and, and the, the, the reason that that was a problem, a big reason that was a problem is because, um, uh, you know, no difference than the first years of c container adoption is when for people are first playing with something like um, cloud, uh, it's, it's like getting your first automobile uh, back in the, you know, 1905. What, it's a toy, you drive it around the ranch, you show it off to your friends. You're not looking for insurance for it, you're not looking for street lights or stop signs, you're not looking for bumpers, you're not looking for seat belts. Um, and when somebody comes to try to sell you all that stuff, you're like, I just drive this around in my backyard. And it takes a while for enterprises to absorb something as, as serious as cloud in a way big enough for them to get off their butts and start thinking about the actual ownership of what running large applications or many applications in the cloud or for that matter, multiple clouds actually means. And until they, they have the pain of understanding what that um, ownership is, they're just gonna buy the toy and play with it effectively. Well, and then of course, to your point, now everybody is, the things that Anstratus, Anstratus was doing and Service Mesh were doing with the agility platform is what everybody wants and needs now. But yep. then when you still, even when you give them a flavor of it, they're still not ready to use it because from an operations perspective, they don't know how. So we have lots of customers who are using cloud health for data economic, for the economics of cloud so they can actually see there is the easy button for you to reclaim and all that sort of stuff. Most of them still won't use it because no one, no one in the business actually wants to own the risk. IT doesn't want to own the risk of telling the business they need to right size. Then the business goes, well, I should right size, but if, I right size and then I lose revenue. Who do I go? Who do I go yell at? So there's still this people process piece that that's not in there, and I've added it to the to the list because I know that I know that Tim Crawford is going to be all over that. So is, is there a, is there a higher level um, opportunity for discussion there of how do you manage the black box? Because the the I, theme that Caroline was pointing out is is virtually identical to the theme about owning IT in general, whether it's the full data center or whether it's um, implementing something like what Rob builds. Uh, you know, it's the same sort of thing. It's like, well, it sort of works right now. And if I do anything, even if there's a risk of 0.5%, <laughs> nobody gives a shit if I don't do it. But if I do it and I cause a problem, I'm fired. I'm crying. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so since, since you just mentioned the part about I'm fired, I want to bring something up. Does anybody think that IBM is going to become sexy again in the next five years? No. Who's IBM? <laughs> so, so, so I, I, I would like to pose that as the I would like to pose that as the serious teaser conversation. And the reason why is like I was saying, Colo is now sexy because it's called cloud adjacency, right? <laughs> And so everybody's looking at distributed data center models, which is really what Colo was, but it's now cloud adjacent and you're distributing your data sets and all that sort of stuff. And there's one manufacturer that also has data center footprint, one, and it's IBM. They have oh. the most data centers out there yes, they from do. a hardware perspective. And they still have all those big outsourcing contracts, which are very similar to running cloud operations in AWS or in Azure. So I would like that to be a big teaser and like a huge debate we can all have so, on whether or not so Big can, Blue will can, become. Can you sexy. can you phrase that in a I like will. less less vendored? Way? I mean, like I'm I'm happy to go ahead and 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 put the put the target on IBM, but you know, can you phrase it in a way? I will like, phrase it. I will phrase it. I will phrase it based on a data center um, ownership perspective. Like, like one growth, you, you could also 
phrase it just from a vendor legacy customer perspective. You've got all the big strategic outsourcing contracts with IBM. We could look at Dell Technologies and say the same thing about the 60 million VMDKs that are running in on-premise VMware environments. Um, you know, we could say the same thing about HPE. Each one of these legacy vendors has their own particular legacy problem that they've got to contend with. Pile of waste. So, you know, the it thing is. for me now that, uh, you know, I live in the, the I'm, I'm the, you know, customer these days um, in consuming cloud uh, is that um, my patience for things like cloud adjacency and such is 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 departed i could not imagine still working at dell or with anybody who has to deal with people who are buying servers or co-locating anything and i just uh you know um uh you know i mean one of the reasons i think the the uh the 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 there's a growing gap between people who are still stuck in uh, building systems, you know, the old way versus, you know, people who have been living and breathing cloud for the last decade. Um, you know, I, I, have an, I, I have something I want to get done. It gets out there and done and deployed in, you know, no time at all, I, you know, where, <laughs> whereas, you know, when I was with Dell, uh, <laughs> that wasn't the way it worked, you know. Um, I'm sort of rambling there, but I guess it's a, it's 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 me being polite and saying that as as little as I believed in private cloud or or, or, or hybrid cloud, you know, when I worked uh, at Instratus or at Dell, I really don't believe in it now. George, George, I heard you're still waiting for that VM approval from IT. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> Well, that's kind of, a, kind of a good point. There's never been any standard definition for private cloud. There's always been this comparison between private and public, but there's never been anything close to any kind of definition for what a private cloud is. So, so that, that's actually a good point, Rick. I think that what would be fascinating if we could pull some, and, and this is like a selfish interest, just as a, uh, as somebody who learns from all you guys, I would love to see like a, a heavyweight bout between Simon Wardley and Joe Weinman to cap everything off. And they could talk about hybrid multi-cloud versus cloud versus disruptive innovation and just take the gloves off and go. So one, one thing I'm looking for it in the list, I don't see it, is applications as well. So if you go back to why did we end up with this three-tier monolithic, that, that's what's lasted us for 25, 30 years. But there was something before it and it was IBM, right? So something before it, now we're going to something different again because the way that the applications are being written is different. So is there a place for that to talk about how the applications are driving the need to change or the ability to change the architectural design? I, yeah, I think uh, applications idea. are the one uh, that, that's actually driving the infrastructure decisions, in my opinion. I think uh, we should be talking about it. But well, yeah, that, I mean, applications is what is driving the, the data gravity discussion, the network latency and the network dependency discussions and all that, right? It's, we have to go through the, from the top of the stack down. That's really what's driving a lot of the change. Mm -hmm. Well, and that was, OSI again, to, <laughs> and, and Chris, that was, that was a big topic of discussion in that podcast episode that I referenced earlier, right, was yeah. was this top-down pressure that the line of business teams are under to get to, to, to have even faster time to market than they've ever seen before. And they're doing it through software and whether they get, whether they get the other line hardware from it or whether they get it from running an Amex on a public cloud, they don't care. Right. It's this notion of to, it, uh, to a line of business developer, there's no such thing as shadow it. It's just work. And, and that, at, uh, that, that, that attitude and, and other choices that that leads you to make to meet those those time to market pressures. So yeah, so I, I used to, if you don't mind, just I'll wrap up that topic a little bit. Rob is I used to blog or actually tweet a lot about this under the Lean Cloud hashtag, and 
for me, I'm actually living this right now. So because I'm small enough, I get the full life cycle of the customer empathy. So what George and Pete were just talking about is sort of the innovation phase of cloud, phase of cloud or edge adoption. But on my end, after I get customers to use my stuff, I want to show my investors I've got kick-ass gross margin. So I'm really focused on what Caroline's talking about. I need to minimize my OPEX. I can't just bring cool stuff to market. I've got to make money. I've got to make gross profit. And so that's where I think, you know, you've got, you've got to have the, either the customer empathy for a small customer that thinks about all these things as one, or obviously all the large organizations we talk to where these concerns are very much siloed. And, and you find throughout the life cycle of an app or a module of an app that different things rise to the fore over time. We are starting to get the next wave of people who are coming in at the next hour. Does anybody have to go? I'm good for a little while. I'll, I'll yep. do, I'll, I would do housekeeping if not, but. I, I have to bounce at the top of the hour. Yeah, six o'clock Eastern. Okay. Um, just Thank as a, as a small housekeeping item, because I, I don't want to disrupt the flow of the conversation because I love the brainstorming. I, I do want to keep these topics, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put this together and then we'll bring topics up. I'm going to throw it into this Mighty Networks thing, which is new to me, but it, I like it so far as like creating a neutral space for us to sort of organize and have the, the conversations. So um, if you can, please subscribe to that and then we'll, we'll, we'll throw some of these questions on. I was going to take the last 10 minutes of the next hour to talk through some logistics stuff and, and topics and things like that. Is that, do, I, I don't want to spend any more housekeeping time because I don't want to disrupt the and Robert, conversations. Uh, yeah. in, that, in that space, can you post the, uh, the uh, Zoom recording? Definitely. I'll yes. just, because I'd love to grab the, I'll catch up on the next hour after. I, I can stay a, a few more minutes, but I just, I want to make sure I don't, I want, you know, I pick up the tracks and. You know. I'm going to, I'm going to try and get, get a transcript out. Okay, cool. And so uh, then we'll, we'll be able to get some, you know, sort of time, time stamps and, and go. I mean, because this is, these are the topics that we need to be thinking about. Um, and I, I'd like to be able with this format to, to stretch it out, right? Because we're not, we're not constrained to a day where we had to fly into Vegas and then party and then recover and then have calls, right? It's, we've got the time to actually go in and pull in, you know, you know, the, the top speakers that we, we think we want to have talk about it and have a focused conversation on all these topics. And there's, I think so critical. I, by the way, the last time we did this, uh, we were, you know, we were, we were pretty light on like analyst and media. Do we want to have any of that kind of participation this time around? I wasn't, I wasn't thinking that we would, I'd actually rather, but I'd love to have an art the discussion on if we want them and why. I, I, I would like to try and bring in this people who are doing it in industry and do AMAs would be yeah. my thought. Like, can we get some, you know, the, the CIO of a bank to come in and, and do an AMA, have some standard questions that we ask around these topics and say, well, what do you think about something we've been discussing and, and turn the, uh, that, I would love to do that. I'm more of a practitioner, more of a practitioner thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, hearing from the practitioners is better. Yeah, that's yeah. easy. Give that job to Tim. So yeah, so I'll be, <laughs> yeah, I was Tim waiting for AMA. that one to come. <laughs> gonna say, I was gonna say, although we let Krish in the last one, the general, the policy of not having the analysts and the media folks there, I think, actually helped serve to make it a very good forum because people, it wasn't there was no marketing in it, right? It was all it was all just superior discussion and debate and. In some cases, even agreement, which was fascinating. But I think if, if people want to come, they can come, right? Analysts can come, press can come. Yeah. No, Ooh, well, yes, just, they want to, yeah. But uh, it shouldn't. Uh, but not speaking. As uh, John said, it shouldn't uh, lead to marketing and uh, all the stuff there. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's a question of who participates versus who observes. Mm, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a really good uh, delineation, I think. Like that. And like, you, for instance, like for example, you if you did. Sponsors. Sorry, well, I talked there? over someone. <laughs> oh, I, was saying, I was saying, as you said, who participates and who not, and all of a sudden it came to me, do we allow sponsors or not? 
Uh, my vote would be no. But mm -mm. I mean, everyone yeah, wants cash, but why would we need sponsors for a virtual event? Yeah. Yeah, the problem with sponsors is like they put the money in and then they want to push their agenda out there. So yeah. I think uh, it, uh, in Cloud 2020, we face that problem. Like uh, we need to sort of make sure uh, that is taken out of uh, picture. But, you know, in fairness, let's say this becomes an event attended by a thousand people someday. That's where you want to have sponsors and analyst track, you know, and so forth. We may be getting so, yeah, ahead of exactly. Uh, when you have that kind of a crowd, at least you have the leverage to tell sponsors that you pay and uh, get out of the way. So <laughs> you don't have the leverage at this point. So uh, yeah, yeah. I I don't. Th this is a nice thing. If 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 the people in the call can help moderate and and draw in the mighty network stuff and the, just participate, if there's no there's no material costs except the time. So I, I don't feel like. You know this this i don't i didn't want to turn this into a marketing thing it wasn't michael just like I, the 2020 one wasn't either um yeah you know, I, and right i don't to that point, i don't want to be anti-vendor either like some of these events like sre con are sort of like if it's not open source don't talk about it so i, I don't want that rule either um yeah but rob i would go back to what's the purpose of this this exercise you know to begin with right and if it's really to drive drive home some of these points and and come to some some specific conclusion i think the question then becomes is there value that any given vendor would bring to that and I, my guess is probably not you know maybe there's a thought leader or two that fits into that maybe but I think I would go back to just the brass tacks of what's the purpose of this and just focus on that. Stay true to that form. That's and and for me, I, there actually is like I, I would love to see us write down a statement of of what we think is going on. And in some ways, I think the vendors would interfere with that. Yeah, well, it, it is interesting to note that, uh, you know, I, I don't know everybody that's on this Zoom conference, but I can name at least four of us who are founders of startups. Um, and my guess is the reason why we've done that is because we were dissatisfied with the, the smothering that the large vendors do in terms of their, their approach to uh, the market. And that particularly worries me that we're not gonna have a full spectrum of opinion on the market. And so mm. I do think that we probably need participation from the bigger vendors too, just so that we make sure that we're not thinking in our own silo. Yes, yeah. but let me, no, let, wait, me offer some, let me offer a, a contrast to that because I am working with a number of large enterprise vendors and I'll just be candid. Most of them are completely out of touch with reality. They're living, they're living in a past reality right now. And I know that sounds really harsh. It's not That's meant right. to be, but they're struggling as much as the enterprise customers are struggling. And so I think I, I would just caution to be careful about that. Plus the other thing is if you want people to really engage and listen to this, they're not going to participate if they're going to get that marketing push. They can sit in the comfort of their own one-on-one -on -one conversation and, and get that. So again, I would just go back to the brass tacks of what are you standing up for? What is the purpose of this? And, and use that to guide you. Uh, and I would add to Tim's point there. I, Andrea, you raise a really good point. It'd be good to actually get a, a, the vendor perspective, but I think that's why we have why we have analysts and we have a lot of analysts in the community we could actually rely on to distill the vendor messages for us. Oh, and so and true. that's where I think having, you know, for example, uh, Jana, Jana Karam, right? Johnny is really good at doing the deep technical distillation of where the vendor's solutions are, for example, right? You know, so if we, if we wanted that vendor view of where vendors are going, that's what the analysts I think can bring us. And they're at least still fairly objective as far as instead of having a vendor come and do the architecture type stuff. But also in our professional networks, we have people, we know thought leaders at the major vendors, right? One of them is here, Caroline. So, so all we need to do is, <laughs> is, is basically okay. get the thought leaders that we know and trust, and that will have decent vendor representation for a first cut at least. I think that's well, the way said. to go. And, and what happens is 
the, the only thing that happens sometimes is that they um, have to watch their tongue about what they say and how open they can be. They might, the, the people we all know as thought leaders, inside vendors are very technical and very good, but they can't say exactly what they want to say sometimes. Yeah, so like, I'm lucky. I get to say whatever I want to say because I'm on the Dow Technology Select side. And so I am in the, at the, I wish I was as high level trusted advisor as Tim Crawford, but I'm working my way there. Mm -hmm. Tim's, my, Tim's my goal, right? Tim's my goal. <laughs> so, but so, I'm looking at it more from the customer problem perspective and I'm not thinking about it from the product perspective. I'm looking at the operations. I'm looking at where their skill sets are and people, then only looking at where they're spending and their technologies and going from there. And speaking of which, one of my really good friends has now joined, Mr. Halstead. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Chris. I was having Ooh. some technical challenges getting, shifting from Teams to, to WebEx to Zoom. Oh, God. <laughs> too, so, many, I mean, too many video conferencing clients. Yep. <laughs> as, uh, as somebody who is at a big company and who has spoken my mind pretty openly, over the years, I can, you know, I think that the, the key is if you're getting, if you're getting thought leaders that are actually active in the companies that they work for, you're going to get people who are hopefully honest about the situation that they're in. And so I think you're going to find that you get much more open viewpoints. If you don't pick marketing people, but you pick, you know, field CTOs, you pick um, folks like Carolyn, in the position that she's in, you know, the people that are meant to be sort of the open, honest advisors to the customer, uh, you're going to get a, mo a more open, honest discussion about the current situation. I think that my, my key thing would be to say, stay away from marketing, stay away from, um, you know, from SEs, even to a certain point, and focus on the people who are out there that are meant to be trusted advisors to, you know, client executives to, um, to core decision makers in these institutions, because generally, if they're going to have that trust, they're going to be relatively honest about the situation they're in. You lose trust quickly if you go in the pure marketing mode. That's my thought. I, I, I agree with James. In fact, uh, you know, during Cloud 2020, we specifically told the vendors that they shouldn't go on a marketing. And uh, we brought in the analysts and uh, journalists as moderators so that they could keep uh, vendors uh, from going into marketing i have seen i have seen some cases where uh, those moderators literally shut people down uh, if not in cloud 2020 in the other one the DeployCon. i think uh, we can do, do uh, go with the vendors but uh, make it clear that it cannot be marketing What do folks think about getting some some sitting CIOs, some practitioners involved as well? I know that I'm not the only one on this on this call that has some CIOs that in our network that we know would be great contributors uh, in terms of some of the thought leadership they're doing, and they're actually on the ground, you know, uh, you know, practicing what uh, what what we preach, as it were. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the only difference between, um, you know, James at uh, AWS and Rich or me uh, or Val is that James actually works for a giant company. Oh, um, it's VMware now, but thank you, Mark. No, the wrong, wrong James. <laughs> wrong James, sorry. I'm okay. thinking about the James that builds uh, the servers at... Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. James Hamilton. Hamilton. Yeah, James Hamilton. Um, but you know, the, the I think I think the key to having the CIOs participate or the folks that are actually implementing the, the stuff that we work on, we as the royal we of the industry, um, is that they they become the challenge to um, any of us falling into our set of assumptions. And you know, we we can all rally around the idea that what we're talking about is the right thing. But if you got 10 people from Google or 10 people from Amazon or Microsoft and you put them all in the same room, they would all rally around and say, what's wrong with those little guys? Why aren't they getting on board? Okay. So um, uh, I, I know what's right because it makes it easier for me to build what I want to build. And, and I feel like it makes, provides more flexibility to the customer. But I'm certain that when Werner talks to customers, he believes that what his company is doing is making it easier for customers as well. 
So Mark, I would echo that. And I would say at the first go around of this, I think the most impactful uh, attendee at the event was uh, Jonathan Murray. Um, yeah. Yes, for sure. Yes. He came at it from Agreed. the perspective. Yep. And then, and we would also, also say, you know, Chris Halstead is now on the call. Um, and I will have a disclosure, he is a customer of mine, but we talk about having practitioners also be able to speak, right? And so we have one, you know, yep. and some of you have already met Chris um, at uh, reInvent last year before COVID. Yep. And so, you know, I mean, Chris, will, Chris, I'm sure can give us some really good perspectives when looking at the, um, our documents as like what else we should be even thinking about that we're not thinking about. And he comes from, um, you know, a very complicated, complex customer environment. And I'll chime in and say none of the providers are making it easy. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. Talk on me. Yeah, I mean, to me, that, that's part of what, I, I guess some of it even, you know, even in these big vendors that are, that are in, you know, in the lead, they're, they're not necessarily, they're doing what's right for them. Um, that's why I want to, I, I do want to get the practitioners to come out and say, what, what do you, you know, what, what would you like to see happen um, from that perspective? Agreed. If that's, I think, uh, if, bringing if, they're, if, you're, if they're willing to share it, right? That's the, I, we have to be yeah, careful that we, don't, practice, we don't turn you know, that going, into a, you know, a LinkedIn festival for these, for, for the people who are talking either. I, right. I don't know that we can prevent that. Um, it's already, the world's already like that. It's why I like Mighty Networks isn't LinkedIn, right? Hopefully we're not going to, at some point we could turn it into a no automatic uh, acceptance and start restricting, you know, restricting invites. But, right. Yeah, I think bringing practitioners is one, one way to get these vendors to listen to. Otherwise, uh, they will be talking and it will be marketing. So maybe uh, <laughs> letting the practitioners talk, I think uh, we can get them to listen. We don't want to hear what the vendors are planning to do. That's not our goal, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. But I think a startup founder track, you know, speaking selfishly now, would be interesting because I mm -hmm. find myself wearing the two hats. I'm a vendor and a practitioner at this scale. And yep. uh, I'm certainly learning a lot about the other side, you know, living in both, both roles as opposed to just one. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but well, uh, last time John did it without a separate sort of track, right? Like I, all you folks were from big companies, Cisco, NetApp and all, but uh, John and uh, his team sort of uh, got their voices heard. I think we can still make it uh, work. Uh, by mixing in uh, large vendors as well as startup, that way uh, startup could push back uh, uh, maybe when large vendors are pushing their own agenda out, out there. Yeah, we'll figure it out. I, mean, it all, it's, it's, I think it's an yeah, important we'll voice now. Right. It's easy yeah. for, 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 the, for the, uh, the online piece, the non-interactive, it's easy enough to add a topic track and, and start collecting some, some pieces in there. Because um, And that was one of the things I'd love to to talk through, I, I put on the list and we didn't talk about it, was disaster scenarios, right? <laughs> I, it would be really amazing to have, you know, have a, a session or two where we're just like, all right, what could actually go horribly wrong? You know, what what causes everything to fall apart? You know, the, the Bill Gates, you know, oh, there could be a virus that it disrupts global trade. That'll never happen. Never happen, don't worry about it. Um, so it'd be fun to sort of go through and, and talk through, you know, what would it look like? What would, what would it look like that would have Amazon all of a sudden become a unpalatable cloud infrastructure? Yeah. And who brought up the fact that Alistair was comparing, you know, the future consolidation of cloud to the consolidation of the airline industry? Because that prompted me to think mm. it's a very viable scenario now that a particular event or series of events could take out AWS, Azure, and GCP. Well, there's actually yeah. another thing that we talked about, you know, in uh, uh, the James and I, I believe had this conversation, you know, back before the Dell acquisition was the, um, the uh, and, and I think this might have been a result of the H1N1 stuff even uh, that, um, uh, uh, who knows, I 
get so many things confused. But uh, at any rate, um, was, is the idea that um, you want to have a footprint in the clouds even for a lot of your uh, traditional legacy stuff because if there is a massive disaster that strikes, everybody at once is going to be trying to do a land grab in the clouds to recover to the cloud. And if you're not, uh, you know, if you don't have your stake in the ground there, if you're, even if you have otherwise legitimate needs to be on premises, you know, um, you know, that sort of disaster will fuck you over. Oh, one of the, one of, to George's point, I mean, there's a couple of different ways that I would look at that. One of them um, is pretty obvious in the sense of the pandemic, but the other one is that the accelerating potential risk of climate change on our global infrastructure and on uh, migration of people and how that might affect our ability to deliver um, global infrastructure where and where we where and when we need it. I think that's a, a, a clear opportunity for discussion. And the other one, I mean, you know, to, to take this point a little bit further, um, a lot of good stuff. I'm not saying that this blog that I wrote was good stuff that came out of the 2020 event, but um, but even back then, I wrote that the, uh, I said a duopoly, it's more of a triopoly now as far as the United States is concerned. But, um, you know, the, the, the problem with the three vendors is it doesn't have to be a disaster. A disaster can be measured a lot of different ways. A disaster could be a security break in. A disaster could also be that the federal government says too many of the government's transactions are happening on one or more of these cloud providers. As a result, we have to put regulations in place to regulate how and when they add, who they add, whether they can work across the border in China, whether they can't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a potentially a direct impact on major investments that companies make. And so while many of us in the industry still like to compare cloud to um, uh, energy companies uh, and the delivery of energy to our homes, I still think, have always thought, that's a terrible analogy because energy companies have largely failed us from an efficiency and innovation standpoint um, for the most of the last 80, 80 years, 90 years. I'll go a yeah. step further, To Mark. add to that, uh, if you, no, just, uh, just to add to what Mark said, uh, another example is wireless providers. We have three or four of them and uh, they are screwing us up right, right in front of everybody's eyes. I, I think that's a problem. Uh, I, a disaster sure. or not, that's a problem. I'm curious though, because I think there's one difference here, which is I, I personally think we there's four companies because you got to include Alibaba. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's yes. four companies out there in this space that yep. are absolutely dominant and own an incredibly vast amount of the market share. This is a worse situation than any other market that I can find in research in terms absolutely. of, except maybe for like when you go back to, uh, 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 sea trade back in the early uh, British Empire yeah. of a of a small set of monopolies owning so much. I think there's a bigger risk globally, and I think there's a bigger risk that governments will respond to that global risk in unique and differing ways that could actually disrupt the way these guys operate. I mean, just look at what's going on with the the California decision on employment with Uber, and just how much that's disrupting those businesses to the point that they're saying we may have to stop working in California for a while. Who, who knew um, I think there's, there's a really good chance that government has not caught up to the situation in any way, shape or form. And that it is in fact politics and government that will disrupt um, the, the way that we do commercial digital business in the future, for sure. Well, That's I, a great I, point. You know, my yeah, favorite so what, journalist there, just one, one quick point is uh, Kara Swisher. So if you follow yeah. her, her yeah. podcasts are amazing. Her articles in the New York Times touch on this topic all day long, James. And she'd be a fun one to invite because she typically gets a lot of mainstream people that are in the mainstream view of where things are. But she may enjoy, you know, uh, people that tried to predict the future seven years ago and are trying again. I think it would be really interesting to get straight government people too, because if you ever watch any of the congressional hearings, like the one they had a couple of weeks ago on antitrust in general, or if you dive into um, the, the, the process by which a president can be involved in an m a decision, which dates back to President Ford, by the way. So I think some of this stuff is, is government stuff we never even think of that is going to do exactly what you just said, but it would be 
really interesting to have government people um, that are part of that policy making and understand it, at least from, mm. you know, the American point of view, Canadian, whatever other countries we could get, that'd be kind of neat. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. One of, one of my customers is the Air Force. And um, one of the things that, that the Department of Defense has done is they've identified 16 different categories of critical infrastructure in the cyber battle space. And cloud computing is one of those. They've identified the cloud service providers as a critical point of failure for the US economy. And um, that, why that's important is that, you know, we normally think of the government as, you know, kind of regulatory driven, um, but it, in, this, in this case, it's actually mission driven by the Department of Defense. And they are actually doing a lot of thinking about, well, what happens if the Chinese Ministry of State Security takes down Amazon? and they can do it for an extended period, that would have massive impacts on the US economy and global uh, European economy and so forth. Um, so I, I, I think Gene is absolutely right. The extent to which we can get some of those people involved, uh, I think would really add a lot to it. Wow. Yeah, and my point earlier on about the hyperscalers getting taken down wasn't a disaster event. It was a risk to their fundamental business models is what I think we should also be discussing. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that the, these topics are coming up because these are actually some of the conversations that have happened um, as part of the Wall Street Journal's CIO network and executive network. Um, now, they're off the record conversations, so they can't come out publicly, but getting some of those folks involved that have taken part in those conversations might be interesting, too, because it is pretty darn provocative and it's frightening, absolutely frightening. Um, the potential. I mean, people kind of live in a, in a world where they don't actually see the reality of what we're having to contend with. And I think that's the piece that, that kind of lay here. Are there specific verticals that are, need to be represented in here, whether they are hardcore users util, utilizing cloud or not? And the financial community being a a particularly yeah. important one um, I, on just so many different levels, including um, regulatory and statute, statutes that have to be followed, care and feeding of the data that's specific to financial, much less, you know, the vulnerability of the, the country or the world generally, if someone decides to put them in a box take them out. Yeah, I think there are two pieces that are rich. One is financial services, um, just because of the economic impact. And the other would be healthcare. Because, and especially, as you point out, data, um, just look at what we're dealing with, with vaccine research that's taking place. Um, some of the folks that, that I'm working with and have talked to, they are doing research all the way to the atomic level. It's both fascinating and innovating, but it's innovative, but it's also scary because the pace in which they are taking this data and running with it is at a pace that we have never, ever come close to. And we're talking about things that, have, that usually will take years to a decade or more, and we're compressing it into a matter of months. Yeah. And so there's a lot of new things here. And the problem is what's on the line is human life. At a large scale, it's only going to yeah. get it's only going to get more so, right? I mean, in the next that's in right the next ten years, uh, things that we think uh, are by osmosis that we learn and do, we'll will our people younger than us will have forgotten how to do because it will happen through technology, and it's already happened for for our kids, and and will certainly happen more for their kids. Um, so, I want to throw out another topic, and this is really wide. You guys can just shoot me down, laugh me, throw, throw virtual tomatoes at me or whatever. But I first um, broached this subject in public and just coincidentally happened to be in front of Tim um, when I got mad at the CEO for DoorDash. Um, and the, the topic of Uber um, uh, triggered me again. Um, is it, does it make sense for us to take on the, the discussion of our responsibility relative to how um, labor is con is assumed to be a consumption and throwaway item uh, in building what are being called innovation companies. How is Uber an innovative company 
if regulation is what they have to fight. They're not yes. innovating. <laughs> they're fighting regulation, and and um, and they're not. They're, not, they're You can't. You can't tell me that a successful business model is designed on building on throwaway human chattel. That, that, that doesn't uh, doesn't add up to me. So I, I think we have some responsibility to talk about that, write about that, say something about it. Well, certainly future of work wise, right? That's the big argument and debate that I think our society is going through right now is exactly that is this idea of, hey, everybody can sort of self market and and uh, and market their skills and, and you know, get paid according to what they're able to do versus the reality of the way that the, you know, our employment models are built and especially the way our benefit models are built. Um, healthcare, uh, life insurance, you name it, right? So, um, yeah, so I think that's, I think it's an interesting topic because I think it, um, I think this idea of commoditizing things that do work, namely servers and services, um, and then saying, well, why can't we treat people like that is, is a fundamental, you know, it, it is a fundamental issue that we're dealing with right now. And I think we're making, we're going down the wrong path. We're not going down the right path. So I, I put a topic up there earlier for um, automated inequality, and I think this is one channel of it, is mm -hmm. the idea that poor people can be used as chattel and they can be used and turned through without any thought to what, um, like you were saying, Mark, to what the whole process and platform um, does to the whole existing um, set of platforms that support people that need it. But then I think also just the amount of, the way that data is being used like it's great that we're racing towards a cure and gathering all this information and going faster than we've ever gone but what happens with that data now that you're able to aggravate it and you've got it all together what happens if you can decide a whole set of people with a whole set of um of um characteristics that you can now find them and identify them and know where they live this all happened before and it was with a big three-letter company called ibm so yep. like how do we how, how do we learn from the past this whole idea of automated inequality because i think it's all the same thing yep yeah, and that, that's, yeah a, I think, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty broad topic i would extend that to uh things like the gaming industry and um you, you know not necessarily people we think of traditionally as poor um mm. yeah, another thought when you were speaking Gina, was about how the nature of startups has changed over the last 10 years um, that uh, in, in now it's 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 much more tactical than it than it used to be uh, in general the, that uh, um, there, there's much less capital chasing big bets and it's more you know do you have a bottoms up business model where you can have an exit event in four years uh, that's driving innovation out of the ecosystem um, and, and kind of a tangent to that is the whole open source thing we were talking about as well. How, you know, we haven't really seen much in open source since Kubernetes as, as far as anything radically new. So I, I kind of want to go back to something Gina said uh, just a few minutes ago um, and ask the question why. You know, why are we doing this? Why Cloud 2020? And what are the most important things to to talk about and figure out. You know, I tweeted about this, uh, about something just, I think it was last week, um, and got a lot of interesting responses to it, where there's a lot more conversation happening about the Microsoft acquisition of TikTok than there is about getting computers and access to education for kids, um, you know, as we think about going back to school. And cloud plays a very central role in these both of these situations both of these scenarios and so i guess my question would be one of what do we focus on and why and that should be something that guides the conversation in terms of the topics um, because I, again i think it'll it'll also draw more into it and these other issues will start to sort themselves out over time too but there are some big problems that we can solve, we can at least start the conversation with um, that will have a very meaningful impact. I mean, especially with the brain trust that's just on this call, myself excluded, but you know, with the brain trust that's on this call, I mean, my God, we should be able to move mountains. I, I would love to, I, 
so what you're describing to me is a mission for the 2030 discussion, right? I, and I would yeah, love for us to, to, to capture, yeah. right? We've been yeah. capturing ideas. What's, what are some of the things that we think the reasons that we want, right? So my, my, when, I, when I originally started thinking about this, my thought was, you know, in you know, a couple of months, we'd actually have a, you know, a meeting sort of like this, but after we'd had a chance to think about all these big ideas and we'd write something down and say, this is you know, either what we believe is happening or what we're concerned about happening. I, I, I don't know what the out, output looks like, but I, I, I love the idea of having something concrete that we're driving but towards wanna, sort of mm. right down. But what, what, mm. what do we want that to accomplish? Can I suggest a sort yeah. of overarching topic, which is, I don't know how, whether you guys have seen much on this, but this concept of build back better, and I don't mean a political thing, I mean, this is more about how do we react and learn from what's happening, because what's happening could easily happen again, and most likely will, if you've read the, the recent Bill Gates uh, post on this, but the, the notion of build back better is, is, is taking on board things like the UN Sustainable Development Goals and taking this stuff seriously and, and actually trying to get something good to come out of what we're all going through right now. And then, and then the point of that is that's a very, very broad sort of theme, but then how does that apply to the world we know and understand, hopefully? So, so I'm not suggesting we, we try and tackle every aspect of it, but what can we contribute to that? Along those lines, I think, you know, just a, a mainstream theme for this is we didn't really black mirror the scenario seven years ago, what's happening today. I think it's high time we start doing that, right? So credit to Gina again. She was the only one in my mind that black mirrored. Yeah, she, so, you guys remember yep. my famous I, comment about, um, I, I don't want so, genetically <laughs> modified yeah. salmon. That was my yeah. freak out moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I think uh, as Rob, uh, Rob said, like I think we should keep this as a mission and try to it. Let's be honest here. Uh, if this is the path we are going to take, automation is going to disrupt almost everybody's life uh, the way it is going. So I think uh, uh, we can't say that it's not going to impact me uh, or us as the tech sector. It's going to literally disrupt everybody. So I think we should take that into uh, account and uh, keep that as the mission for what whatever we are discussing, uh, whether it's uh, on the infrastructure side or wherever you are discussing. I think that should be the mission. Like, how do you... I would like to add something else as well. Um, I think it was Mark or either Tim or James who actually mentioned there is going to be a future generation of decision makers, right? You know, they're they're very they're known as the FDMs in the at the actual advertising world, right? There's always going to be FDMs. So as as they come into the workforce and things like that, what are we also wanting to be able to start doing so that those people can also be part of our group and then also learn from our experiences because somebody said right all the things are going to be automated so all of the things we used to build from scratch are now so easily automated they don't if you take some of the automation away it's like ah like wi-fi is off what am i going to do <laughs> right so how do we also include them and so that way there's a there is it's not like i don't want to use the word legacy because it's overused but it's how do we pass on our sets of knowledge down to the future generation of people, you know? So like Rob, for example, having your two boys, <laughs> like be involved, yeah. you know, cause they're already in the works, in the workforce, but what, what else can we do to start bringing other people in so that this knowledge doesn't get lost? Yeah, I think we should bring in the future generation and get their perspective on everything too. I think uh, it shouldn't be that bunch of, uh, Old people are sitting here and talking about it. They should be future. They should be involved. Yeah. You're so for yourself. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. Hey. I always sit there and 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 wonder what's the cabal of people or or whatever the sinner, sinner, whatever g of people that is uh, assembling now around the 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 next great technical revolution that's going to change everything right because i'm i'm almost certain out there there's a group of people getting started in terms of networking and building around each other seeing in their, each other at all the same virtual conferences i guess now but <laughs> seeing each mm -hmm. other at all the same conferences right and and building a rapport around 
event-driven architectures or, or you know, um, around, uh, uh, you know, new, new ways of working or whatever it may be. But I, I think that's, you know, one of the things to do is, is to kind of keep our eyes open for other communities that we can invite in to say, look, this is a cloud conversation, the carry over of a cloud conversation, but in reality, it's about what it's enabling and what it should enable by 2030. And so we want your voices in there because what you guys talk about obviously will have some impact and some delivery. And at the same time, what we're observing may help, you know, help you understand some things as well. So that's, that would be my suggestion is not even just kind of go for individual youth, but to go out there and see if we can find a community that we can invite in and say, look, this is partially about, you know, whatever it is you're, you're talking about as well. And Rob and others, not to hijack or, or do a drive-by of this conversation, just give it my perspective. I think many of us, myself included, focus on the tactical discussions of cloud. And like, if we think about cloud 2030, what can we do leveraging technology to make the world better? Um, and get, bring in some other groups, like somebody mentioned the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals. We've tried to, my startups tried to work with the UN it's really fucking hard and oh, the, the cultural inertia of them not wanting to do something and change in all of the committees is untenable. But I think the power of this group plus bringing in other relevant groups to leverage technology to improve, whether it's the financial system identity to be self-serving uh, or many other aspects of the world, including healthcare is in my not so humble opinion should be the long-term goal for 2030. Yeah. So I agree, Mike, and, and that's where I think of groups like uh, the World Economic Forum, and there, there are others. I mean, Web has their own agenda and set of issues, yeah. but- <laughs> Then right, the World I Food mean, Program, they're kind of all the same uh, cast of characters. Right, but that's why I said, you know, it's, it's really what's that, what's that higher level purpose? What's the why? That you're going after you know duncan was was far more eloquent than i was in terms of explaining that but it's it's kind of that higher purpose because in 10 years i would believe that in to some degree cloud won't matter and i know that's kind of that that probably right. falls falls flat in this matter. group but but it, it probably doesn't matter you know i think of like what was being young generations and james for explaining that and i'm thinking you know, if I brought my kids, I know James, you have kids at the stage, Caroline is, but if we were to ask her, what do you care about cloud and where did that kind of fit in? They'd be scratching their heads, or mine would be going, you know, I don't, you know, why should I care about this? I guess the question is, are we too far into the weed and maybe we need to pull us back first to say, what is that higher purpose and use that as the guiding principle to say, okay, where cloud kind of fit into this? Much better said than what I tried to articulate. Yeah. I mean, my, my, I tweeted this the other day as a joke. I mean, we may as well call, you know, this recap client server 2020, because that's what it's going to sound like 10 years from now. And we say cloud 2030. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> but I, does this, does this mean bringing in, you know, part of what we're trying to do is bring in people who are actually going to use the tech. Because I mean, I, I think we're all builders, right? And that's why we got together. It's like, all right, we're, we're trying to build something. We want to hear how it's going to be used, right? That's got to be a part of the track. And that it doesn't harm people. Right now, maybe we don't think about that very much. I guess that's the right. point, Rob, is will we be builders in 10 years? Will all of us still be builders? You know, we've, so for example, I've been a builder in the past, but I'm moving further away from building and more toward how I leverage technology to make an impact from a business standpoint. So yep. it's less about the, the underpinnings and more about how it gets applied. There will still be builders, don't get me wrong, but I don't mm -hmm. think they will be as widespread as they are today. And they definitely aren't as widespread today as they were 10 years ago. But Tim, I yeah. think a thing that Caroline said a little bit earlier kind of applies to this. Um, we may not be builders anymore, but the reason we're able to pick up and understand and carry on is we do have that heritage and that knowledge and that experience. So does that knowledge and that understanding of the basics of how things are built, is that no longer valid? And do people not need to know that? Because I will tell you the kids that I work with 
say exactly the opposite, <laughs> that they want to know the basics so that they understand the not basics, you know, the things no, that they play with. That's a great point, Gina. I mean, I use the, the example of those of us that fought through the Linux wars back in the 90s. I mean, there were a lot of things that we learned during that experience that could be applicable today, right? When, we, when folks get into these religious battles. Yeah. And yet the folks that are in those religious battles weren't even in the workforce back then. <laughs> and so true. how do we carry that knowledge and that expertise forward? So we say, okay, we're not going to fall into those same ruts, those same conversations over and over again. But how do we, going back to what Duncan said, how do we build better? How do we, how do we make this better and focus on the bigger impact? That's a good point about the Linux wars because I was a sysadmin there and I built, I had to build drivers for mice and monitors and I don't care about that. I will never, ever, ever use that again. So that kind of speaks to what you were talking about too. Well, and then to, 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 at the Tim's point, you know, I'm not building anymore, but am I still getting really involved in architecture, architectural discussions? I am, but I also am looking at more what are the business, what's the business value to my clients? And, and you know, especially with um, many, many customers, they, they like having vendor relationships. And so they tend to buy a little bit of everything but then they're not able to actually use any of it the way that <laughs> they're supposed to, to actually gain the value of using that one tool, right? So that they'll buy the tool because the tool says you're going to get 125% cost saving. Oh, but there's a caveat. If you layer it on top of the three other tools that you bought that also told you you were going to get 125% cost savings, guess what? You're not going to see the cost savings because you peanut buttered it across. So there's things, but that leads to like the old Linux wars that we all used to fight, right? We knew that if we picked the wrong message bus, things would be slow. And so, but that level of conversation is not really happening anymore because people are buying the tools, thinking the tools will solve the problem and layering it, not in the way that they're supposed to. Here's another perspective on that that has to be said. The people that are still building, particularly down at the low levels, including, you know, device drivers <laughs> that Gina and I used to write a long time ago, is a $1.5 trillion cybercrime industry. You know, so there's not just, you know, people that are gaming algorithms here. There's people that are building the infrastructure to, to game everything for profit and other motivations, yeah. of course. So, and, and again, that's a, a factor we have to consider here for sure. In fact, that might be a, an interesting theory is that the most creative and active builders today are the, are the cybercrime builders. The ransomware games and others. Yeah. Um, Rob, do we want to leave time to start going through this list and prioritizing and some of the things? I, I mean, I'm just afraid that if we if we want to cover all of these things, it will just would never happen. Um, or is that something we want to do offline between this and the next session? So, so I, I'm glad you're asking. Um, and yeah, with an eye to the clock, I think that's the right. I would love for people to basically sign up and and say, "Hey, I want to take on this topic or this uh, this you know uh, this discussion," and and then start organizing, saying, "All right, let's you know I'll I'll coordinate a discussion on it. It doesn't have to be. I, I don't want to turn this into powerpoints." Right, I don't think any of us do. But at the same time, if we're talking about, hey, this speaker would be amazing, let's have a, a conversation about this. We have a starting set of notes. Um, I, I, you know, you know the, the, the two outcomes would be, you know, Rob or somebody else starts bugging people to say, hey, we're gonna have this event. Can you come this week and do this? I'd much rather people pick off an event and say, I'm, I wanna have a three part discussion about this and, and keep going about it. And then we'll, we'll provide the forum um, you know, get it on a calendar so it's people can block out the time. Um, that was sort of how I was hoping we would we would end this because there, there's amazing topics. I don't I'm, I don't want to moderate all this stuff. I'm not not fit to. Um, but at the same time, you know, I want to be part of all these discussions. I want to hear it. So, can people pull in and say, hey, you know, this is a topic I want to do. If you just put your name on it, you know, I'll, I, I can I can track you down. Um, and then the other one is, is this, you know, if we do this as a weekly series, maybe switch it into the morning if that's what people want or alternate it 
you know, are people willing to, you know, come to, you know, 50%, 30% of the sessions and say, you know, be, you know, be part of this thing as an ongoing, ongoing discussion. Rob is, and apologies for not being here earlier. Is there a kind of a general consensus that this is a series of events as opposed to kind of one day, two days of, uh, of intensive mm -hmm. sets of um, presentations? And kind of a follow on question there. Have we discussed at all any thought that might be given to innovative approaches to using Zoom and, and everything for this kind of purpose. Um, I'll point to some of the more innovative uses of Zoom in some of the university settings where what they've started to do rather than do lecture courses where everybody shows up at the specific time for the lecture the lecture is literally recorded in advance, put in place. You watch the lecture as a student and what you are attending in real time is the discussion and the interaction around what has been presented. And granted, this is not university. This is not meant to be necessarily pedagogical, but I would point to you that there are probably some innovations stylistic that we could make use of in doing this. I love that idea. To, to me, this is why the Mighty Network thing, when I found that, because I, I was thinking I would just do this like you're describing, it'd be a whole series of meetings or an event. And when I found that this, you know, this tool where we could have a, a dedicated social network with topics and, and chats and stuff like that, it, it felt to me like we could do exactly that. You could say, all right, we're, you know, Rich is going to present about this topic, but instead of spending 20 minutes presenting, here's, here's the, a video you can watch, you know, beforehand, here's my presentation beforehand. And I actually think we should encourage that. Um, you're going to get people who still fly by and haven't done the homework, just like in regular sure. university but, classes. But you have, you're making more use of the time and people yeah. in place at the same time for the interaction and the exchange of either, you know, contrary views or, you know, you know, a real discussion as opposed to some you know, becoming a topic talking head. Yeah. I, I like that yeah. idea a lot. Somebody else was, I missed who was said. Sorry, I was just going to chime in. So I've used Mighty Networks before. The Women in Cloud group um, <laughs> used it, and it can get really, really chatty really fast, mm -hmm. um, even more yeah. so than something like Slack or, or Teams. So just something to be aware of. Yep. I agree with that. Okay. And it's it's one other place to have to go look. I mean, I'm sure all of us yeah. already have a number of Slack channels that we're all, you know, Slack's up and it's running. So again, just trying to lower the hurdle. No, I, I, this is, I, I really tried to figure out what would make sense for this. Like the, I'm doing another se weekly series um, for DevOps Lunch and Learn. Like w there's a group of us who are like, I just want to have small DevOps topics. Um, and they're, they're fun, they're light, you know. And the, the challenge is I started running out of the RackN website. And so every time you would, I would promote it, it would show up as a RackN lunch, which isn't the goal. And so, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm open to suggestions on this, but I, Slack to me it is, is way too closed. It's really hard to have a Hey, here's an interesting link and have it show up in a, in a good searchable way. Um, and LinkedIn is a, frankly, a wasteland. So for me, Rob, <laughs> like for me, I think it's just community. Whatever platform you pick, it'll grow as it grows if, if you, if you cu curate it correctly, right? But I think is way, like for me, what I think is kind of more critical is that humongous list of great things everybody thought of. I think Tim's right. There has to be a pullback of 
what is, <laughs> what are we doing? What is the reason for us all spending our time on this? So um, I don't know, that's just my suggestion. I think a simple statement of the mission of doing something, whether, and, uh, and I, hate, I don't mean a mission statement. I just mean a, a simple statement of, look, we, we're looking to do an ongoing series of events on, um, on topics related to how cloud will continue to influence the world we live in in the next decade. Or the, the one that Tim put out there, or it was a Tim or maybe it was uh, Duncan actually, the one that Duncan put out there. Um, you know, is it going to be a single event? Is, is, is it going to be building a community over the long term? It, if so, what's its purpose? Um, who are we, you know, and then, then we can talk about who do we want to draw in and what are the tactics to do so and all of that stuff. But I, I do, I do think, I love the, you know, Cloud 2030 says something to me. I don't know if it says the same thing to me that it says to everybody else though. And so putting something around that, what do we mean? Um, is probably, I think the next important thing for us to work out is just, you know, we have a ton of ideas here. Is it a technical conversation? Is it a social conversation? Is it a combination thereof? Those are the kinds of things we have to answer next. I, my, my thought had been that it would be easier for people to have a spread out series of discussions about this, that it would be easier to bring in speakers and easier for people to, to find the time and sleep in between sessions to me, which also adds to the spice, right? If you, get, you, know, you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I should have didn't even think about that. And then you have, a, you can keep recording them. Um, but, but James, I would love for this to become, right? I think, I think it's useful to have a goal for like a meeting, like a, a, a summit or something like that. But I would love for the community to stay in place and we could do quarterly or half year check, you know, like, like keep the, mm -hmm. keep the heartbeat going for, you know, a weekly or biweekly, whatever it ends up being. We have so much right now, we could go, you know, twice a week for the rest of the year and still have stuff to cover. Um, so we need a deadline, but then I would love to keep going and, and keep coming up. And, you know, cause Mark, like I watch Mark, I'll call you out specifically, where right? You post these provocative things on LinkedIn. Um, we could have an hour conversation on, on mm -hmm. those posts every week, frankly. Um, right, and, and Gina could, go ahead. We could also do one where maybe, you know, we bring each of us, maybe a smaller group, brings one person who's maybe new in the industry, a fresh graduate, our own kids, someone we know who's interested in coming into the space so that they can also hear about some of the conversations and we can ask them questions. Yeah. You know, I think that would also be fairly valuable. Um, I, and, and I had a great example. I had an EBC and I had um, an illustrator draw out the themes from the EBC. And at the end, we don't normally do this, but I said, okay, what do you think? You know, as an outsider, as a non-techie, what do you think? And her feedback was really great. She goes, you know what, Mr. Company, I use this app, I use your app. Why can't you make recommendations based on my behavior and my purchasing history? you should be telling me what I need. Why do I, why are you not doing that? Which was very interesting because she was a total non-techie and a total designer consumer person. And that was great insight. So I think it'd be nice for, uh, it's not a social justice kind of thing, but it, I think it'd be cool if one of us could bring different people in to start getting them to see like, here's in a way how the sausage is made. We don't have all the answers, but you know, we do talk about them. Yeah, the other aspect to consider is, uh, are we going to bring in people from other countries? Uh, right now, except for Duncan, probably we are all like uh, US based. So how are we going to enable it, uh, enable other people from other countries to come in if they want to come in? So that's something you need to think about. Well, yeah. Well, this also, is, this is a bad Duncan's time also a time traveler too. He's living in another, another day <laughs> from the rest of us. So we should probably think <laughs> about time zones a little bit. Sure. So, I'd be happy to reach out to people. I mean, from Singapore, Australia, yeah. Amsterdam, I'd be happy to reach out to people, even even Lagos, Nigeria. So um, mm -hmm. just let me know if you guys want uh, some outside outside the country's borders. You know, I, I think England and, and the UK are both disasters, so neither one of them want to own each other. So we're definitely different countries. <laughs> <in trouble. laughs> 
I, I, mean, I think uh, bringing out from uh, bringing out from those places is critical, especially in uh, the, the uh, based on the overarching uh, team team, which is Cloud Twenty Thirty. We need to be uh, bringing the, those people in how we are shaping uh, the uh, team. So I think we need to yeah. bring in people from all well, those countries. Like, yeah. like I mean, who who knows what the? I mean, one of the things that we don't think about too much is that we hear okay in in Africa, the vast majority of people actually do all of their work on a cell phone. Mm-hmm. Yep, what and exactly that too, not smartphone, like uh, the old fashioned yeah. uh, cell phone. Yeah, and so what exactly does that mean? Maybe it means nothing. Maybe it just means that's the client and nothing else will change. But what does that really mean? Is that different from, from how we all stare at our phones as we cross the street and stand in front of the coffee shop and whatever? Is it different? And does it affect their society different? Does it affect how they'll adopt technology differently? Will they skip major portions of what the rest of us think we have to go through to get to the future? I, and I think, you know, getting access to that, that kind of market to better understand what the potential uh, uh, trends might look like would be really interesting, at least to me. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. And also another, another thing I am sort of like, uh, why I want to bring these people, especially those from Africa and all those people, all those places is genetics is going to become a key thing in the next 10 years. And uh, right now there is a big uh, disparity between developed nations and uh, non-developed nations uh, in terms of the genetic data. Uh, we need to make sure that the cloud 2030, which we are going to uh, uh, discuss here, is going to make uh, uh, empower them to have their data in so that any medical advan- advancement, whatever uh, we are going to do with genetics, is going to help everybody. So I think we need to take all those things into account. Uh, so I think we need, that's important. Absolutely. The other thing is with Africa, they have the biggest um, population of youth in the world. So if we're talking about wanting to bring the yep. next gen with us, Africa is definitely a place 50, to... 50% of people. their population are millennials. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's way more than here. Duncan, you were going to say something? I was, I was just going to say that um, I like the idea of there being a sort of constant sort of heartbeat, as somebody put it. But also, I, I was quite looking forward to the idea of there also being you know, we were aiming for a more concentrated virtual event, and I'm assuming it will be virtual at this point, yeah. um, <laughs> that, that, uh, that allowed us to, I guess, explore things over, you know, a couple of days. It doesn't mean you have to sit in on everything because the, the beauty of the virtual events is, you know, you can sort of pick a mix. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, it feels to me like, you know, having tracks or having themes or streams or whatever you want to call them is not so old hat that it doesn't actually help to sort of, you know, stitch things together. So in other words, dare I use the word, a hybrid model. Um, <laughs> so, That'll never um, exist, Duncan. That's transit. It's a bad idea. It's a bad yeah, idea. Yeah, yes. yeah. I, it's, well, we could probably a series of hybrid. A, what about a series of unfortunate events. There you go. <laughs> I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've been calling it a, a, a deconstructed conference. Decon. Decon. <laughs> there you go. All right. You get, you get a free bug spray. <laughs> I still vote for black. De- the decon, decon con is what would yeah, it be. Right. Oh, goodness. I, but I, I do like the, I do want to have a event which I, I think is, because I, I think that that's useful for people to focus on, but I feel like we have enough here that we should just do it. I mean, we didn't have any real agenda, right? We sat down and we had this amazing conversation that I now want to dive into these topics in, in depth and mm-hmm. we're going to, ha- you know, we bring in some more people. It's going to be just stunning. Yeah, I mean, um, I need 12 people to give me ideas for writing blogs and, and making assumption remarks on LinkedIn. So you guys have been very helpful today. Thank you. <laughs> At your service. Uh, so, Excellent. Uh, but just I'll, I'll let you logistics. know where to send the royalties, Mark. All right. All right. Thanks. <laughs> hey, wait, wait. I'm in line first. Um, the, 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 just straight logistics. This time, bad, you know, early morning, West Coast time better? I would we get a better spread of people if we were nine a.m. West Coast or eight a.m. West Coast? I think I think I mean realistically, if we want to get the country more effectively, eight a.m. West Coast is probably the best bet. 
because yeah. then yeah, I would, I would agree. Much time for and, the and you still get you still get get the right the European. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Would would eight, eight that's getting early from a West Coast? Per, I don't care. I'm in Central, eight? so no, eight's eight, fine eight. for me. No, eight's good. Eight right. is mid morning before, before the day good. kicks right. into that. If so, that's and then, too early, we we have the wrong West Coasters. <laughs> And then, third, and then do and then do a third. Like, is Thursdays okay too? I'm just keeping it. I'm, I'm, I'm not taking the bait. I'm not Thursday. <laughs> There's Thursdays at eight. Okay. Thursdays. Let's, let's let's roll that. Okay. Um, hey Tim, I'm I'm with you if you want to do a data twenty thirty conversation because a lot of the stuff that is in that document right now, anything driving cloud adjacencies, that was all data driven. So I'm in. Yeah. I will partner with you on that. Cool. Awesome. All right. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to be bugging people this. to I gotta take, drop. I'll see to you all soon. topics. Yep. Good to see you, everybody. Everyone. This was amazing. Right. I appreciate right. it. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.